Hello everyone, my name is Barbara and I would like to welcome you all to our latest Novage webinar episode. This week, move to Bing with free training. Building information modeling is an intelligent model-based process that has proven invaluable on a large complex uh, project. Uh, but what about the rest of us? In this session, we'll take a look at the benefits of Revit from a small firm's perspective and learn how technology is positioning small businesses to be more competitive, productive, and profitable. Who wouldn't want to do that, right? Um, present is, uh, presenting today is Aaron Vorwerk. He's a registered architect and civil structural engineer in training an AC industry technology evangelist based in Fort Worth, Texas. He holds graduate degrees in architecture and engineering, and he has acquired widespread industry experience over the past 20 and plus years. In his role at Autodesk, Aaron supports customers across North America, informing and influencing, influencing BIM workflow adoption and strategy. And before we get going, here's an overview of what we do at Novage. Um, Novage is one of the largest online stores for design software. We offer a huge assortment of software solutions that cater to virtually every designer's need. Uh, come to Novage.com, especially after you get the full gist of the amazing promotion you're going to hear about at the end of this session. So stay tuned and get ready to sprint to BIM. Uh, for more daily software news and limited time promotions, pay a visit to the Novage blog and follow us on Facebook, Google Plus, and Twitter. Coming up next week, Point Cloud Processing with Vision Lead Air. Last but not least, today's webinar is free and is being recorded live. So if you want to rewatch this or any webinar episode on our collection, just head on over to Novage's YouTube or Vimeo channels. And now I'm going to pass the screen and um, the mic to um, Aaron. And um, take it away, Aaron. This is your show. How does that look, Barbara? Looking great. OK, well, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm happy to be here today on behalf of NoVeg. Uh, again, my name is Aaron, and I'm in Texas. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be. Uh, let's jump in. This, this, uh, this name, this title, Bust the Myths Around BIM for Small Firms. If you to Google that, you'd find a page that Autodesk has created uh, talking about our efforts to uh, accommodate uh, small firms that are looking to make a move into BIM or even into just intelligent 3D modeling uh, without the BIM acronym. So let's jump in. We have a lot to cover today, and, uh, and I want to make sure we get your questions answered. My agenda is, is as you see here, we're going to talk a little bit about business value, talk uh, somewhat about workflow considerations. And before I get into that, let me let me just say this. I'm I'm an architect, as Barbara mentioned. I have a lot of experience with Revit. I led two firms uh, starting back in 2005 through their transitions to BIM as a as a project manager at the time, and uh, probably have you know 10,000 hours of experience working in Revit before I went into consulting, and uh, and then eventually came here to Autodesk. So this is a very personal thing for me. I'll be talking to you about my own experiences. Um, as, a, as an architect or practitioner moving into a BIM workflow. Um, we'll get into a few, a couple of tools today, and I'll be showing some Revit LT uh, while we're talking about tools. I'll talk about one firm's case study. Um, you can find more about their webs, uh, uh, their transition today on our website afterwards, and then uh, a couple of ideas for how you might ease the transition. So first, business value. We joke that in every Autodesk presentation, there's a uh, there's a wheel. So here you go. But BIM is a different idea than CAD. And for those who have kind of shied away from BIM as thinking it's not applicable, uh, you know, because your your business case isn't there, you think that just for big firms or complex projects, we want to kind of correct those myths a little bit today. The idea of BIM is simple. It's instead of taking um, a 3D idea in your head, so to speak, you know, this vision for what a project is going to look, look like, and representing that in lines and arcs and circles, or maybe through 3D prisms, this thing that we call CAD, and then having someone else translate that representation back into a building, 
what we're trying to do is digitally simulate the building and the computer. So we go through the process of making an intelligent 3D model, and that, that a level of intelligence can vary. In other words, it's not an uh, you know, all or nothing approach, and we'll talk more about that in a minute, but what we're trying to do is simulate that building in the computer so that we can simply go out and duplicate that in the field and we'll already know it works. Now why are you BIM ready? You know, you may not realize this, but you are, and, and the reasons why, um, according to Kate Morka, look at the bottom of the slide, you already think in BIM. In other words, we as humans, we like to see things in 3D, we think about things as being real, we don't think about lines and arcs and circles. We think about the actual spaces and, and objects that we touch and feel and see. BIM improves coordination. Really, the whole idea is that if we do a better job of representing our ideas, then we'll have less surprises when we build the thing. BIM takes care of the details. Again, you know, if we have this thing put together in the computer, we know how it's put together in reality. BIM is good for business. There's a lot of reasons for that, all the, all the way from the very front end where we're trying to sell a concept to the productivity enhancements we get by having an integrated coordinated model on the back end. And I, I believe this personally. BIM is an investment worth making. Uh, there's certainly not an easy transition. You could make the argument that moving from paper to CAD was easier because essentially the process didn't change at all. We just had a tool that could erase and copy faster. But in the case of BIM, we're moving from these representations commonly in 2D, but these basic representations to something that is uh, much more sophisticated. So there's, there's some work there. But once you make that change, there's no going back. And, and for countless firms have told me that. So in terms of myths, you know, BIM is not about firm size. Uh, it can be a one-man shop that, that now competes against larger firms because they have the ability to represent these, these projects in uh, more detail. And BIM is not about project size. <laughs> this is a great, a great image of a, an igloo that's been <laughs> detailed out. But you know, really, this, the principles of BIM, BIM being a process and not being a tool, the principles of the BIM process apply no matter what the project size is. And you'll, you'll read a lot about this from Autodesk, but, but really BIM is not about the cost of IT or the cost of the software itself. Um, that's, that would be a very narrow focus and is not you know, really the reality. Now on the flip side, a BIM transition does require careful management. If you if you look at this cartoon, you know I, this is uh, so classic because it's uh, it's true. Uh, I've, we see two people in the office talking about how there's so many standards and they need to come up with one corporate standard, and then of course two weeks later there's now one more standard. It's so we we do need to be on the same page. There's all of this stuff that happens whenever you make a change to your software platform or to the processes, the work processes that you use, and so that does require management. And then I think from a small firm approach or perspective, true commitment is really a requirement. What I mean by that is that in a large firm, you might be able to get away with some naysayers, some people that don't believe in the movement. Instead, you have other folks that are the evangelists that really take, it, take, a, take the leadership role in making this transition happen. But in a small firm, especially if you only have a few employees, you don't really have room for someone to be left out. And so I think in a small firm, it's really important that everybody's on board, that everybody understands where the firm is trying to go. So let's talk for just a minute about workflow considerations. Now, there are obviously some pros and cons when you make a move uh, of any kind. So if you're coming from a CAD world, and what I'm thinking of is, it doesn't matter if it's 2D or 3D CAD, in my case, it was a mix of both when making that move to, in my case, Revit, but whatever that, that um, tool that you would use to, to do BIM authoring might be. So transitioning from CAD, what are the good things that are coming? Well, first, consistency. Um, you have a single, intelligent, integrated digital model. And this, this is significant. I, I can't tell you how frustrating it is for me to go back to CAD now and make a change to a window and then have to change that in every section and perspective and plan view and schedule view that it appears versus just making a change and having it 
always upgraded or updated everywhere. Then there's efficiency. And this is not efficiency the day you start using a new tool, but this is efficiency once you figure out what you're doing. So once you've built out your templates so that your project's set up the way you like, and you know you start a job with the schedules already sitting on sheets, they're just empty waiting for the design to happen. Then when you start throwing your walls in and your windows and your doors in and making this building model, all of this stuff starts populating on sheets automatically and it's already formatted the way you like it to. There's so much that you don't have to do over again. Um, and so there's there's a lot of production tasks that kind of are taken out of your taken out of the work um, process. Um, and then there's extensibility. Uh, one of the things that's key to understand is that without a model, and you know, again, we can talk about how much intelligence goes into the model, depending on how much you're getting paid on, but an intelligent model enables you to do more than just produce the documents. So you can do nothing more than just produce the documents from a 2D set of CAD drawings or even a 3D set of CAD drawings that don't have a lot of additional intelligence added. But if you have an intelligent model, then everything else can come along with that, whether that's consultant coordination in the form of clash detection, whether that's pulling quantities for the purposes of cost estimation, whether that's sending information downstream for a consultant or even a subcontractor to use that information. There's so much that becomes enabled. We're going to look at you know, renderings today, renderings that just come right out of the model versus renderings that have to be set up individually. Um, it could be something like energy analysis. It could be many other things. So those things all require this new, you know, uh, intelligent model. Now, what are the downsides to this? There's certainly going to be some cons, right? So this is disruptive. I, you know, I talked about maybe the transition to CAD was easier than the transition to BIM, and that's true to some degree because we're talking about a shift in your mentality, a shift in your approach. This is a more collaborative way of doing things. This is a more um, messy way in the, in the sense of thinking through things. I mean, so this is, a, this is a very different than a linear CAD workflow where you just sort of add and add and add over time. You do have the potential for risks with personnel. I mentioned that in a small firm especially, everybody needs to be on board. And that's really, that's a risk for any firm. So what do the staff feel about this? Are they excited about this? You know, are they, do they have the skill level to jump in and do this? You know, the success of the BIM adoption uh, plan is, is going to be dependent on those personnel. And then obviously, when you start into a new world with new set of tools, you don't have the content that you've kind of leaned on for a long time. And so, you know, we were, we were very high production rate firm using, um, at the time, Architectural Desktop, which was later named AutoCAD Architecture. And we had a huge library or repository of information. That made our efforts to move to a new platform that much more uh, difficult, especially in terms of gaining efficiency immediately. So it took more time for us to, um, you know, to build out a complete library. And we knew that going in. We knew it wasn't going to be automatic. And that's, of course, one of the one of the drawbacks is it takes a little time. Uh, I think that there's sometimes a misconception about BIM. I talked about this earlier as an all or nothing approach. That's really not what BIM is at all. Um, so sometimes there's this perception that BIM is is too much for me because all I do is this type of job, right? I, I just do, you know, uh, retail centers, or I just do residential or I just do something where they feel like BIM is not um, appropriate to them or it's a foreign concept. Um, and that's, that's really not what it is at all. Uh, BIM is not about the complexity. It's really a better approach to making buildings. Um, and so again, it could be very basic stuff. It could be that all we're doing is creating a semi-intelligent 3D model. Things are pretty much in the right place. And you know the objects know what they are for the purposes of scheduling, but I haven't bothered with thinking about the thermal values of the materials in the wall for the purposes of energy analysis because I'm not doing an energy analysis. I'm just slapping together a building quickly. Um, but it'd be nice if it filled out the schedule. Well, that's still using a BIM approach. You're building a model that has some intelligence to it that you're going to use, 
a bright so so it doesn't mean that you have to go all the way and have the perfect model. There there really is no such thing. Now we get into some of the tools. Of course, um, for, for Autodesk, obviously we have a pretty big toy box, and I'm going to focus on two of the the tools today that I think go hand in hand for small to medium sized firms. The first one is actually Format 360. And you're thinking this is a webinar about, about Revit, right? Revit LT. Well, yes, but Format 360 is a tool that we offer that helps you get your designs into Revit. And I want to make the point that you know, we, I'm, I'm totally aware of what's out there in the market. We have people that will play with tools like 3ds Max or SketchUp or Rhino or whatever on the front end of a process. Format 360 is a unique tool in the market that Autodesk has put together. It comes in a free version, and then there's a pro version that offers a couple of additional features I'll talk about in a second, that it's $300 a year. But it's a relatively inexpensive tool either way. Free is really inexpensive. And, and you're able to take your designs directly into Revit. And what I mean by that is as I create a model in Format, um, as we see in the left of this slide of the Villa Savoy, um, then when I when I save it on in Format, it converts it automatically to a Revit file on A360, on Autodesk 360, that I can open up directly as a native Revit mass inside of Revit or Revit LT. And then I'm able to use that as, as you know, push-pull geometry, use it as a reference for putting my Revit elements in place. It's a much more seamless workflow than creating some simple sketch in another application that can't be used downstream or, or needs to be imported like a CAD file and kind of breaks the process. So there's a way, if you're the, the type of loose, you know, fast designer that wants to be unrestrained when you're modeling, to, to do that, you can use Format and it will bring it into Revit for you for use downstream. So it really starts to connect the workflow. Now there's some other advantages here that I, I'm going to talk about. And one of those is that Format 360 runs on any device. So there's an Android app, there's an iOS app, so you can be sketching on a tablet. But there's also a web app, so you can use Chrome or Firefox, and you can draw in Format and on any of those devices. And then, of course, through A360, convert it to RBT, bring it directly into Revit. So that's a very powerful thing that it's device agnostic. Uh, you can be sitting on the couch with your iPad creating designs. This is a quick video showing a feature of Format 360 Pro. We're able to have multiple users, I think it's eight simultaneous users right now, that can all connect on their various devices and model at the same time together. Um, this, is, this is, again, part of the Pro version of Format, the $300 a year version, but this would enable you, if you're trying to collaborate on designs around the world, to simply do that from whatever device you prefer to use. Now, uh, one of the things I want to point out, you know, this is for the, I guess, for the SketchUp users out in the audience, folks who have gone to the 3D warehouse before and, and grabbed content and converted it for use in, in, in CAD tools or even in Revit. Um, we have built a way, or a mechanism, to bring content from SketchUp uh, and from the warehouse directly into Format. Um, and, and then, of course, because Format automatically saves to Revit, this, this whole uh, you know, this connects the dots between SketchUp content and Revit through Format. So this is a picture of the warehouse, and let's say we pick this particular bench. Well, inside of Revit, I might have this converter running. So this converts an SKP file to a Format sketch. And what you might notice, if uh, I'll hover over this, if you look closely, you also can convert Revit family content to Format. I'll talk about that more in a second. But once you've converted it, then we're opening it directly in Format, and then of course it saves through Format and opens up inside of Revit. Now, one of the things I mentioned a second ago was that there's also a way to bring Revit content into Format. Think about this for a second. We have intelligent objects we call families inside of the Revit environment. So those could be doors or windows or furniture, casework, you know, appliances, whatever it is that you're placing inside your model we're able to map those back to format. So it kind of cartoons those, those intelligent families and makes them useful as little objects for when I'm creating my sketches in format. 
And then, of course, when it saves it automatically through Autodesk 360, those convert back to being the intelligent Revit objects that they are. Um, and so you open up that mass that you've created in Formit over in Revit or Revit LT, and you have all of that smart content already there. So this is a really powerful thing. It allows us to begin to tie together our conceptual ideas and then the downstream documentation that we'll be creating from those. It also allows us to use, of course, that enormous stockpile of content that's on the 3D warehouse. Now, this is another feature of Format 360 Pro. This is the ability to perform energy analysis. And this is a, a new a feature, actually, in the sense that we've rolled out a, a, a platform combining our energy um, tools into something called Insight 360. Um, I'll, I'll jump over to Insight 360 just for a second. I don't want to spend much time doing this, but if I go over in Chrome here to Insight 360, I have a building model open. And this model could have been created in Revit. It could be created in Formit. Either way, I can generate insights from it. And then I'm able to start scrolling through this early design and understand how that building responds to different variables. So I'm told right here on this chart that my current performance for this building is 94 cents per square foot per year, which is a little better than ASHRAE 90.1, the defaults for doing whole building energy analysis. But I'm still quite a ways above the architecture 2030 challenge, which would be 62 cents per square foot per year for this building in this configuration, in this orientation, on this place on Earth. So all of that information is, is embedded in there and sent over from the model. Um, but then I'm, I have all these little widgets down here. And so I'm, I'm going to just look at operating schedule for a second. Well, if this building is a 24-7 facility, obviously it's going to consume a lot more energy. And what this widget is telling me, because it's got this steep uh, curve, is that I'm able to dramatically reduce the cost of energy use in this building if I were to say that it's actually only used 12 hours a day, five days a week. Right? So each of these widgets is telling me, based on runs that have been done behind the scenes, how sensitive my building is to these variables. So let's look at lighting efficiency. Lighting efficiency looks like it's a pretty much a linear curve. So I could look at these different uh, lighting power densities and say, okay, uh, this is, you know, this building is going to be in this range. We're going to be able to pay for upgrades to a certain point, and that's going to affect my bottom line in a certain way. And I can talk about this with the owner and say, so, you know, here's the ROI based on that and based on what it would cost to put in these fixtures. What do you think? And I can go through different types of widgets, like window glass or you know the glazing on the southern walls. And if I look at the glazing here on the southern walls, we see it's not actually that critical to the design. I do get some improvement, but it's not really dramatic. So maybe I can afford to go up just a little bit, bring myself down, just, just bringing it down a penny there per square foot, but every little bit helps. And it helps me make decisions early on. What's actually happening behind the scenes with this tool, what sets me up to be able to do this, whether I send it out of Formit or out of Revit, is our Green Building Studio platform. Green Building Studio is a Doe 2 building energy analysis tool, and it runs, when I send Formit or Revit a building, it runs over 100 runs trying different variables, building orientation, roofing type, lighting efficiency, all the things we were looking at there and more. And then it creates those little widgets for me to look at and say, these are the that actually make a difference in my building. So this is available to you even when you're just you know, sketching up a mass in Formit or creating a, a mix of a mass and actual walls and geometry in Revit. So it's a pretty cool uh, set of tools. Now, I've mentioned that being in Revit quite a bit already here. See, Revit LT doesn't have some of those energy analysis features built in. But you have access to it through Formit. So you have a good combination here at a lower price point than by using Revit. This is just an example from a customer. They were sketching up a stadium in Formit. And so at the bottom right, you see the markers uh, that they were using to, to draw this thing. On the left, you see that they've brought that marker sketch into uh, Formit as a, a, a base. And they've laid that on a, a Google Earth map that they also brought into Formit and then they uh, created their concept for the stadium. 
And I have just one more here. This is a facade study from Array Architects. So they're playing around with different designs and trying to understand how those work. And they like the way they can convey those graphics inside of Formit. And then they bring it over to Revit and uh, publish it out. OK, so now we're going to move into Revit LT. Now, Revit LT, of course, is the bread and butter of what we're talking about today. And I'm going to show a little bit of Revit LT for you. I, I, I'm happy to jump in and walk through uh, models. I'm actually, <laughs> to, uh, to confess this a little bit, I'm going to be showing a little bit of my own house edition. It's a project I'm working on right now. Um, but I'll show some other things as well. One of the, one of the significant pieces of any BIM authoring tool and I'll put Revit LT in that category. And there's, you know, there's others out there, of course. Our own is Revit. Um, and any any of these tools will have a coordinated model, or they should, right? This is this is the key. There's a database at the heart of this program that means that when I make a change to anything, it's changed everywhere. And so, in my case here, I'm going to uh, jump into Revit LT, and we're going to look at a model that's already made, and we'll start another one from scratch. So. Bear with me a second. So, so here we are in, in Revit LT. And you know, my old uh, example here, this is a, an old branch house that I'm adding on a small addition to. Um, it's a, a bath and an office. And, and what we're looking at here is, is, is my set of plans. You know, this, is a, this, is, this is looking at the vanities uh, in elevation. And then at the bottom right, we're looking at the vanities in a perspective view. And at the top, we're look, top right, we're looking at a floor plan. Now, this is all connected and coordinated. And to, to kind of show that, if I select a wall, for example, in this plan view, you'll notice that same wall highlights in the uh, this exterior 3D view, also in this perspective view. And it's probably hard to see here, but it even lit up a line here over on the, the right side of this elevation view, since that's the edge of that wall. Same thing, of course, if I, if I pick on a vanity, we see the vanity top highlight in any of the applicable views. And if you make changes to anything, oh, pardon me, I just opened up that countertop. If you make changes to anything, then what you're going to see is it reflected everywhere. So if I if I wanted to change out the windows, for example, and you know here I've got this double window unit. Um, if I made a change to let's say the the grid pattern on that, maybe I need to open up some views that would show that. So let me let me go down here and grab a exterior elevation of the south of the bathroom. Right. So you can see that window is selected in both views. And maybe I'll just edit it in this view. It really doesn't matter which view you're in um, because, I, of course, they're looking at the same thing. Um, so let's, let's say we have this thing, and I want to change the type properties. So I'm going to have three lights uh, high. Okay. These happen to be Marvin windows, which I probably can't afford. But it, they have really nice Revit families. So I'm going to stick it in there and um, for the best on the cost estimate. Now, what this is actually doing is redefining the type of window. So this is a Marvin, um, you know, uh, 30448 or 3048 in this case, if you're actually inch dimensions. Um, and so two and a half by four. And and I've changed the the grid pattern for that window, which reflects, of course, in this view as well as this view and anywhere else that it appears. Um, so each of these families, even the walls themselves, you know, the, the building blocks of this, are the same everywhere. And in fact, um, I'm going to talk about schedules in a minute, and schedules will work the same way. Now, I don't want to, to focus on this you know, built project too much. I want to just quickly mock up a building so we can look at that a little bit. So let's do a new project. And I'm going to use, let's, let's see, I think there's a, yep, there's an LT residential template. It'll just come with some you know, wall types and so on that we'd be used to for residential. And I'll just start from scratch. So here we'll, we'll do everything kind of live just for a minute here and, and play around with, with Revit. So here we have wood siding on wood studs. You know, maybe I'm, I'm good with that. And I'm going to just use rectangles to define my, my spaces. I've got this little uh, house plan that's just basically two rectangles connected together. Um, let's look at that in 3D. Maybe we tile those views so we can see it both ways. I'm going to select those walls and tell them that they're not actually 20 feet tall, but maybe they're 10 feet tall. Um, so I, I threw those in without looking at them. Um, uh, maybe I want to put a, a roof on this structure and then add some doors and windows. So we're just we're just kind of playing around. But 
let me make a point while we're here about how Revit likes to work. So Revit is short for revise instantly. And you know, when I use Revit and Revit LT interchangeably, don't worry about that. They're the same core file. You can open up the file in Revit LT or Revit, right? So if I use it, it refers to all of the Revit products. So 20 feet here, this is, you know, maybe I want that dimension to be 12 feet. You know, so Revit's about throwing it all in there kind of in the right orientation and then figuring it out later. You can put it in all, you know, sort of slowly and accurately, which is typically the way that we work in CAD, but you don't have to. It's really not con confined to that. Um, you know, I, I just dragged this dimension over here and told it that that's where I want it to be. Oh, that's, uh, I meant to say 30, not 3. <laughs> Um, and you see I'm working in feet here. And if I, if I were to select this object again, it's going to remember where my temporary dimension was to help me get it there. So I can kind of just massage this design. Um, okay, now I want to throw a roof on here. I'm going to do that in the 3D view. And we'll just do a roof by footprint. Um, I'll put it at the second floor. I don't, I don't need to, to go two stories with this house. And um, So I'm going to pick the walls and I'm just going to kind of hover over and highlight those walls. and. And it's showing like it's got a one foot overhang on everything right now. Maybe I want that to be two feet. Um, and you know, I'm kind of getting that reflected to me in plan, so I know that my sketch is where I want it to be. It's all at 9 on 12, but I'm in Texas, so I'm going to change that to 4 on 12. Um, and I'll just finish that for now. And it, it sees that there's walls touching the roof and says, hey, do you want to go ahead and attach the walls? And sure, you know, we could attach them later, but that's fine. So here in this 3D view, I can see that the, the walls have attached. Maybe I want these gables uh, on this end, and maybe on that other end. So I might come back and, and tweak that real quickly and tell them that they don't actually define a slope. Um, and so it's gabled, and you see that the wall is updated too to reflect that that connection. And from there, maybe I want to throw a front door and a couple of windows in here. And so I'll I'll go to door, and we'll see what we have available. We can of course go load more families, as they're called. But what these are, these objects are always called families, and then they have family types. So here we got, you know, a, a, this more is a single raised panel door with side lights, and the types that they've got listed are just different sizes. The, you know, types could represent anything. In this case, they happen to represent sizes. And I'll find a place where I want to throw that door, you know, and I could adjust, of course, what it's doing. You know, I see in plan here that it's uh, it's actually swinging out, so I'm going to just pick on the door and flip it swing. I could use the space bar to do that as well. Uh, so that the door does what I want it to do. And then maybe I'll throw in a couple of windows. So these are double hung windows. A little line appears when they're kind of at their default sill height, which of course I can change. I can put them wherever I want as well, but I'll just throw a few in. And you're seeing the, the design change to reflect that. So uh, in this this view, maybe um, let's, let's try, try a couple of tweaks to make this a little more compelling. So this view looks kind of flat or kind of stale. Maybe I want to turn on shadows, so I'll just show what that looks like. That's a little strong and the shadows aren't really the direction I want, so I'll leave those off. But maybe I'll go into my, my graphics display and play with a couple other things. So I'll turn on ambient occlusion. They call it ambient shadows now. I'll turn on some sketchiness, you know, just make us look a little less you know, rigid, I guess, a little more fluid. I could go a little further on the extensions there. Um, yeah, so that's looking a little better. And then maybe I look at a white screen all day, so I'm just going to make a gradient background. Okay, so that 3D view is a little bit better. You know, maybe maybe I could turn on shadows if I adjusted where the sun was coming from. I could turn on kind of a shaded view, but I, it's a little dark for me to, to be working on it, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it white for now. And then, let's see, we'll go back to this plan view, and I'll maximize that one for a second. And so, in this plan view, first of all, I'm just seeing the outlines of the wall. That's because this is at a quarter inch and it's at a coarse level of detail. So if I turn up the volume a little bit, we see the different layers of the wall begin to be reflected. But what you have to remember is everything is like a sheet of paper in Revit. So if I have this set at a quarter inch and, and you know, it's basically showing me the line weights for a quarter inch plan. I mean, so it's a kind of a good reminder actually of when you're over detailing for the sketch plan to show something. But maybe I want to do a call out here. So I'm going to very quickly just do a plan detail. Um, at this corner, maybe we're kind of showing that that will jam as well as a little bit of a call out uh, just of that corner condition. And I double click on that to open it, and you'll notice already that this doubled the scale by default, but I can I can go a little larger. And what it's doing is actually adjusting all of the line weights and everything accordingly. 
So if I put this next to that, you know, quarter inch plan on a sheet, the hatch for this wall will be exactly the same. The line weights where I'm cutting the wall are the same. You don't have to deal with any of that stuff anymore because again, this is just a single database. Um, so let's do that. Let's just very quickly, and before we jump back to the presentation, create a new sheet. I'm going to just make a B-size sheet. Uh, I don't know if my plan will fit on there or not, but it's worth a shot. So we'll throw the first floor on. Oh, it was already placed on a sheet that I didn't even see. So I'm going to go to that first floor plan. And here it is. There's that the view of the plan. You'll notice that that call-out bubble is empty because the detail that I created is not yet on a sheet. But the second that I put it on a sheet, that call-out bubble is filled. And again, one of the benefits of a connected database is that can't ever be wrong. Neither can the title. The title will always match the view. Um, if you were to change the number of this view, it'll change the number over here. If I delete this view back off this sheet, it'll delete it, uh, clear the number back out. All of the things that we typically redline on a job, um, those things are kind of made irrelevant. Um, so if I change the sheet number, that updates here. It's all connected. Okay. Well, let me. Let me. Uh, I'll leave this open because we might come back here and look at schedules just for just briefly in a minute. But let me jump back to PowerPoint. So automatic schedule generation. I, I really think this is one of the most powerful features. I, I, I talked about the fact that when you change something once, it changes everywhere. That's what we just looked at. That's great. Um, the fact that schedules just read the list of elements. They're just another view, albeit a, a non-graphical view. Is, is wonderful. Um, so back in, uh, back in Revit then, I don't have a very complicated model going on. I'll admit that. I've just got three windows here, but maybe I want a window schedule. And so I'll right click on schedules, new schedule and quantities, and I'll go find the category I'm interested in or, or categories I'm interested in. It looks like there already is a window schedule. This is called window schedule two, but let me just create one from scratch. And maybe I'm interested in the type like so, so I might label my windows like type A, type B, type C. So type and maybe width and height. And uh, maybe I want the family name or family and type, so I'll put that there. And I'm going to move that up ahead of width and height. Width and, height. Um, and I could filter some out if I only want certain ones. There's lots of settings, obviously. So I'm going to sort them by their type. Um, actually, I don't want that one. I'm going to go back to fields. I don't want type, I want type mark. I want the actual label for the type. So I'll move that up and I'll sort them by the type mark. I like that better. Um, and then under formatting, you know, I could I could add up things, I could do counts if I wanted to. I can change the way the thing looks, but I'll just hit OK and I have this little schedule. Now this little schedule on it is is showing me, you know, the, the family name, and of course I wouldn't, since this family name and family type. Um, lists out the type sizes. I could probably get rid of the width and height, or I could change out this family and type to just being the family. So it just calls it double hung with with trim, and then gives me a width and a height. Now these all have a certain type mark. Maybe that's supposed to be type mark A. If I change it, it'll change them all because that's the type of window that it is. So this stuff again remains connected all the time. But what happens if I were to change this? So I grab this one and I call it fixed with trim and make it a whole different size. Well. First of all, the schedule is updated and it knows it's a different type mark. It would give me a warning if I tried to call it A because, you know, it's not. Um, it's got different dimensions, but there's ramifications to this. If, if let's say I didn't know where this was in my model, I can say highlight it in the model um, and it'll bring me to wherever that window is in the model. But I changed this in the schedule. It changed it in the model. Um, normally, you're going to do it the other way around. Normally, you're going to change the model and, and, uh, and then have the schedule update. But just be aware, right? Everything's tied together, so that's a, that's a really good uh, thing. It's even good if you get it wrong. In other words, if you make it wrong in one place, it's wrong everywhere. Instead of being inconsistent on one sheet and causing confusion, that's a little bit about scheduling. That's you know very high level, but these schedules can be built out with all the parameters that you're interested in. And if you build the family content or customize the the out of the box family content to have the parameter information, the basically the different info like hardware or whatever else that you might care about, you know, things like door swing or fire rating or whatever it might be, then that stuff will populate automatically into the schedules as you drop the content into the model. That's really powerful stuff. And then we have, uh, of course, the ability to render. Now, 
I, I'm just picking a few things here that we're looking at in Revit LT today, right? So this this is a really nice one from a sales standpoint. Like if you're going out there trying to win work, it's good to know that even though you've you're you're getting the the price break of buying Revit LT or the suite over buying the full-on version of Revit through the building design suite or something like that, you have access to the same online uh, A360-based photorealistic rendering. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to demo this only in the sense that I'm going to go show you some things that have been done in A360. And one of those was a series of images from my, my house. So I'm going to go back to Chrome. And I'll go to what the rendering.360.autodesk.com site looks like. And I have a list of the different projects that I've done. And I've kind of opened up a few for us to preview. Excuse me a second. OK, so the first, the first I want to show you, I'm going I'm to kind of pop open a couple of these. And in fact, I might do it from my computer because I've downloaded the, some of the images to be um, a little higher resolution. Let me try it first on the screen as a preview. This is not the full resolution but it may give you an idea of what that looks like. So this is a sample project from the full version of Revit. It's just a sample, you know, high-end house. And this is what a daytime rendering looks like. Um, this, this is a 4K image, but I'm, I'm showing you a small preview of it. Um, you can see that in the cloud, it rendered in an hour or so. Um, it, on your own computer, it would have taken a lot longer than that to, to render a final quality advanced exposure 4K image, 16 megapixel image. But here, it, it it, it happened in the background. I could have sent 100 images at once, and it would have still taken 30 minutes to an hour or so to render them all out. Uh, this is that same room at night, just a preview of what that looks like. And you could argue that, like in the previous shot, I could have done a better job with the grass. Or in this shot, there's probably some more stuff I could add to the scene. But the lighting quality is really excellent. And I also can do an illuminance study. So this is an illuminance study showing me at night where the light from those spots is hitting, right? Illuminance is light falling on a surface. And so we're seeing that generated out of A360 rendering. In fact, you can do still renderings. You can do illuminate studies, both of which we've looked at. You can do solar studies. You can do um, panoramic renders. I'll show you a couple of those in a second. And now you can do stereo quick renders. So if you have a, a virtual reality head, Oculus Rift, have support for that through A360 rendering. So that was uh, looking at that house. Here's another example. This is from a hospital atrium. Um, and so in this particular hospital, we've got a, a nice render. It took about an hour uh, on the cloud. And of course, I can download the image from there. Um, and then here's an illuminant study of that same space. Right, so we're seeing light following on the surfaces. And then you might recognize these uh, from earlier. I just if you if you paid attention to my house plan, there's previews here of, of what that bathroom might look like. You know when I'm trying to sell my wife on on what this design is going to come together as. This is prior to the application of paint color, but gives you an idea of of what that space feels like and what the color fixtures look like and the you know the various uh, pieces, the ADEX Neri tile and so on that I'm playing around with using in the space. Now, if I if I jump over, let me let me open up briefly because I think I've saved this uh, in a local folder. Let me show you this at a full res. So I'll just open up one of these images. Here's a good one, um, and uh, let's see if I can show that full screen. Uh, I guess that might be about right. So, so anyway, so this, this is image of the bathroom we're seeing, of course, I'm not on the sea. That's, I didn't put a background on the scene. But um, you're getting an idea for what the, the lighting quality looks like. Um, all the fixtures actually have their IES lighting profiles, so they're actually correctly rendered in terms of their, their initial lumens and so on. And so we get an understanding of what that space will feel like. Uh, more interestingly, maybe, um, you can do these panoramic uh, renders and so this may be a little choppy on your end. It's very very smooth on my end. Essentially, the A360 service will output a, an HTML file that you can open up in Chrome and spin around in and get an idea from any spot in the room. So you can generate you know multiple renderings like that. So those are really powerful, fun features um, of A360 rendering that you have access to um, through Revit LT. 
I'd like to briefly walk through a case study. We've got just a few minutes uh, more that I'll cover, and then I'll I'll uh, turn it over to to Corey. But as a case study, I, I presented with a, a uh, Jeffrey is his name. I presented with a gentleman from a firm in Houston um, at the Texas Society of Architects Convention around BIM for small firms. He's really um, he's really been an advocate for Revit LT and for BIM on the small firm side for a little while. And his firm, the firm he works for, is Moly Design. Um, he he pointed out a few things. This was part of his presentation uh, that he gained from Revit LT and just from the move to BIM as a process in general. The first he pointed out was exploration and quality with speed. He was talking about the ability to test different design alternatives quickly and have them look good and be able to show those to the client. So really, because he was able to play around with the sort of real building, if you will, and then be able to produce documents as needed from that. Uh, downstream, he wasn't sort of wasting his time by doing a cool model that he couldn't use, or or the other way around where he was locking himself, he could not explore, but instead he found a balance there. I, I think this one probably is intuitive for all of us. If if we're modeling, um, we're we're going to be able to. And that's in any tool. We're going to be able to to do more compelling visualization, even if you're taking that model, rendering it out, and doing some touch like Photoshop or, or whatever it might be, you can quickly get model data into, into that situation, right? You can get it to prepared to that level. And you can bring the actual working model, not just the conceptual model. Uh, I like this one from him. He said, design, present, construct. It's really the whole, uh, you know, the, everything he needs. So they could use it from the beginning to sort of figure out how everything works, mass up their, their model. You do have massing tools. And then, uh, even if you didn't use Format, and then from there be able to produce his documents and, and uh, everything else he needed. And then I, I also appreciate this. This is, this is their own um, sort of confession that when they looked at Revit LT and Revit, they, they were kind of interested in Revit, but Revit LT was a lot cheaper for them, and it had what they needed to learn this process, right? So really, they're still using it. They're still on Revit LT. They, they have some interest in maybe some of the more advanced features of Revit, but they haven't had to make that kind of investment. They've been able to do it with Revit LT and be successful. So a couple of tips on easing the transition. This is uh, from me. So choose your timing. You know, look for a pilot project. Uh, don't look to, to make the most complex project you've ever done as a firm your initial uh, Revit LT project. That's a little bit of an aggressive approach. Look at your schedule. You know, if you have a client that's not necessarily in a rush on a job, that's always a, uh, always a good place to start, especially if, if they're interested in the additional value you might give them. So, you, you know, you might say to them, look, if you're not really in a hurry, we're kind of learning this here, but you're going to see so much more rich visualization. We can walk through the model with you versus our 2D plans. You know, that, that's something that they might find really compelling. Budget, you know, obviously we, we need to make sure that this flies. This uh, solution, whatever it is, if it's, if it's the move to Revit LT to begin to support BIM, needs to fit within, you know, you need to have a business case for it, obviously. And then when you're moving from 2D to 3D, so for the folks in the room that are not already modeling, Right. We we generally recommend. This just this is not from me originally, but I, I like this um, this way of thinking. Start with floor plans. That's what you're used to doing. Right. You're used to starting with floor plans. So start with floor plans when you're modeling. You don't have to model in 3D in terms of the way you work. You're going to be creating a through model while you work, but you can be doing that from these 2D views. Then you add some schedules because you're going to need those too. Right. Those are always in your documentation. Then cut some sections. You know, sections will be the next thing because whatever falls out from that model, and that's sections, elevation, 3D views. You know, there starts to become a vertical aspect of this um, this set of plans that you maybe haven't had to consider directly before, but now as you're modeling, you're going to have 3D ramifications throughout. And I, I think most importantly, realize that you're not on your own here. So, um, in a minute, we'll, we'll hear a little bit about advanced support which is a, a new and, and wonderful addition to, to, to purchasing from us. Um, you're going to hear a little bit about free online training, um, which comes along with certain purchases. 
there are local partners. Um, and so, so some folks provide just training. Some folks provide software and training. You know, some like Novetz provide everything. And then there's a large, a huge user community. Um, one thing that's important to understand is that everybody that uses Revit or is really using the same platform, and it's, it's such a big platform around the world now that that there are a wealth of learning resources. Whether that's on our own sites, like on Autodesk Knowledge Network, knowledge.autodesk.com or whether that's out on YouTube, or on Revit Forum, or on any number of other um, sites that are out there, blogs and so on. So that's, that's my piece today. I wanted to get through business value, show you a little bit around the tools, and talk just a little bit. Some of those comments are simple slides, but you know I know what it's like to go through the transition. It's not easy, but I'll, I'll tell you it's worth it. So at this point, I'd like to turn that over to, I guess, to Barbara first to, to let me know if there's been questions asked. Yes, thank you, Aaron. That was um, wonderful. Thank you for letting us uh, walk around your bathroom. <laughs> we love that. <laughs> and uh, there's one question, um, uh, repeated a few times, but same question. Everybody's asking, um, do we really need just Revit? We, won't we need extra software to do the rendering? Will Revit be enough? Yeah, what I was showing you there was all rendered in the cloud directly from either Revit or Revit LT. So our Autodesk 360 rendering service is available to you on subscription. You don't pay for the service and you don't pay for quality renders. Um, you get a certain amount of credits, 100 credits to start when you buy a new seed of software. And when you go for final resolution, high, you know, final exposure, um, you pay by the megapixel. So if you, if you do a 16 megapixel uh, render, that would be 16 credits. Um, that's essentially they're a dollar a credit. So the most you would ever spend for a super high resolution image is $16. Um, and you're doing that on somewhere else hardware. Some, you know, it's basically running on our cloud. So you're doing it very quickly. And you're, you're essentially you're saving a lot of money and time. So it's, it's, a, it's a great feature. You need anything. Um, outside those everything I showed you was directly rendered on a360 another question how can I communicate with my providers with BIM with providers uh, yes Pedro you have to be more specific uh, what do you mean you mean partners or contractors uh, let us know uh, sellers Sellers, um, does this make sense to you, Aaron? Contractor. I'm not sure. If you, contractor. You contractor. Ah, thank you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so um, right. So we have a variety of tools. I I, I don't want to go too long on this answer, so cut me off if I go long. So either we can obviously, if if the contractor has no mechanism for communication, we can always export out. To something that they can understand, right? You can you can either print this thing to a PDF, or you can save it as a DWF, or you can um, uh, if they have the contractor has Navisworks, they can open the Revit file directly. Um, there's there's a lot of like ways to get them the data if they don't understand if they can't use Revit data directly. Um, you know, obviously you can print too, but we also have mechanisms for sharing files online, and so. Uh, for example, in some of our suites or as an add-on to some of our suites, we, we often um, advertise Autodesk A360 Team. A360 Team is a, is a platform. Even if you bought it separately, it's, it's cheap. It, it could be um, anywhere from $10 to $15 for a user per month. Um, but that's for a paid user. That's just for somebody who hosts. But if you had, let's say you bought A360 Team as a firm, you would get a hub on which you can host your projects. It's unlimited projects. Then none of the content. Just we don't really even enforce any size limitations. So it's it's an unlimited hub on which you host projects, and you can invite, for example, a contractor or a client or your consultants to that project as free contributors. You don't even have to pay, and they can open up your Revit model directly in a browser. We have an amazing ability to open up even huge. You know, I could open up a one gigabyte Revit model if I had one. And it would open up in a browser. I can spin it around. I can do comments um, that are tagged to objects. And so I can communicate with my 
contractor or my client that way. That's how I'm actually doing my, my house project. All right. So um, another question is, do building firms provide uh, the families? Is it free? Okay. There's a couple of answers there, too. So first of all, directly within Revit LT, there's an insert tab. And on the insert tab, there's a place to a search bar in which you can type in requests. What that does is takes you to Autodesk Seek. It's seek.autodesk.com that has thousands and thousands of Revit families on it. I think 66,000 or something altogether. So maybe there's three or 4,000 lighting fixtures, for example, from manufacturers or generic, depending on the, the lighting fixture. And I can pull those in. Now, that's not to say everything is on Seek. There are third-party sites. Some are free and some are paid for. There's also many, many things on manufacturer sites. So I, I happen to know that I can go to Kohler's website or I can go to our own Seek and grab Kohler fixtures, or I can go grab certain Moen fixtures from their site, or I can go grab certain types of lighting, everything from Lithonia lighting or something, Viso lighting, whatever, from their sites, or go grab Marvin windows or Pella windows from their sites. So there's, there's quite a bit of content out there for manufacturers on their own sites. Some of them are, have been a lot faster at putting out Revit families than they were with, with CAD blocks years ago. Cool. Okay. Um, so another question from Giuliano from Brazil. Do you know the percentage of architecture firms using using Revit in the USA? Is it the USA? So, yes. Uh, Is the, it fifty percent? The, the, the stats. The, right. So the stats I can give you are from McGraw Hill. Uh, McGraw Hill does a, a construction smart market report every couple of years, and in their most recent report. They said on average, or not on average, through the U.S. for architecture firms specifically, the the number is about 70% adoption as of 2014, um, and that that's more shifted towards large firms. So so large firms are closer to 90% adoption of Revit. Um, small firms are closer to 50%. This is a, a year or two ago. So that's so it was huge. a little bit more biased towards the large firms. That's huge. So small firms just need to, you know, get on the train and catch up. And this is the time, right? Maybe we need to turn it over to Corey. Barbara. I think so. I think so I think. Can... Yeah. So Corey, um, I know you have something incredible to tell us. Go ahead. Yes. Hi. So again, my name is Corey Cheeseman. I'm the product marketing manager for uh, Revit LT Suite. I'm based um, here in San Francisco, as is Noveg and, and Barbara. And I just wanted to, I know we only have a few minutes left, but I wanted to mention that in my several years now of working with small firms at Autodesk, um, and also growing up, my, my dad was a, a small business owner. So I understand that everyone wears a lot of hats and that uh, everyone is very budget conscious and you never have enough time because there there are so many balls in the air as a, a small firm owner. So this promo addresses both issues. Um, the first pain point being the price. Uh, this current promo uh, for Revit LT Suite is the annual subscription is over 15% off. So that marks it down to $4.19 for, for the year, which averages just a little over a dollar, a dollar and change a day for Revit LT Suite. And with this promo, you get free training, which addresses a second pain point. When will I have the time to make add, add them to my workflow? So we've partnered with um, uh, an esteemed uh, publisher called CAD Learning, and they're offering 400 uh, bite-sized tutorials. They're online. You take them at your at your own pace. The, this free training is available for nine months. Um, this promo lasts through March 7th. So uh, if um, you have bought Revit LT Suite or you're thinking of doing it after the webinar today, you are eligible for this nine months of free training. And again, that's 400 tutorials. The bite-sized tutorials are 
five to eight minutes a piece. So, you know, at your lunch hour or kind of a coffee break, um, if you want to uh, peruse this site and start taking the training, we really encourage you to do that. Um, you'll also have access to mentors um, for, for any technical questions you have. Um, while you're learning BIM. And something, um, a, a great new offering that will be available at the start of February is free advanced support for um, Revit LT subscribers. So this will give you access to um, unlimited priority one-to-one -one extended hour phone conversations with senior audit support specialists. So yeah, your support and your training and discounted Revit LT are, are all here. And um, if you're interested, we encourage you to reach out to Barbara or Noveg afterwards. Um, they'll point you in the right direction if you want to learn more or if you're ready to do it. Yes, that's great. Give us a call and, uh, you know, I'll show you um, the website uh, shortly. I will take the screen back. If you don't mind, I'm, I'm, I will mm. show my slides. And uh, what a promotion. Wow. Finally, somebody, is, you know, for less than a coffee a day. Because if you live in San Francisco with a dollar, I don't know what you're going to buy. But this is amazing. And you get somebody holding your hands throughout the process. This is, wow. Finally, an offer that makes sense um, for somebody that really um, wants to get working. Fantastic. Um, I want to thank everybody for um, joining us today and attending the webinar. And here's uh, where you can go for, um, you know, uh, check out this promotion. Um, uh, visit our page at noveg.com and you can find this promotion and many other and um, move to BIM, take the leap and, and this time you really don't have to be alone and um, keep following us on Facebook or Plus and Twitter. I also want to remind everybody um, that our next webinar is uh, Point Cloud Processing with Visionly There. And uh, for those who asked, uh, yes, our webinar, uh, today's webinar was recorded and is going to be put on our YouTube, Novage channel, and Vimeo channel. So in a couple of hours, it'll be up. You can go back and check out um, uh, all the resources and the fantastic tips that Aaron uh, shared with us today. This was um, really amazing. Thank you so much, Aaron and Corey. This, uh, I'm sure everybody will leave satisfied today. Um, from the Novage team and from me, um, thank you and goodbye. Thank you, Aaron, and thank you, uh, Corey. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.